I thought sorry, I meant to. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Anna Marie Pyle, who's giving this year's uh, David Green Lecture in Enzymology. And I just thought I would give a little background on uh, David Green. So, so this particular lecture is supported by uh, the David E. Green Memorial Lecture Fund, and it's one of three named lectures we have here in the biochemistry department. And so David Green, like Anna, began his independent career at Columbia University. Uh, he then uh, saw the light in 1948 and moved here to Madison to help found the Enzyme uh, Institute, so the Institute for Enzyme Research. And while here, he was extremely <coughs> prolific. So the number I found on the internet, which, which has to be true, on the internet, uh, says he, he was associated with uh, 700 articles that were published over four decades uh, here, here in Madison. And he really made fundamental contributions to our uh, understanding, understanding of oxidative phosphorylation, beta oxidation, and many other enzymatic reactions that occur in the cell, and particularly in the mitochondria. And he also helped establish the Enzyme Institute as really a foremost center for mechanistic enzymology and helped recruit many people in that area, uh, including Lardy, Cleland, Piranha, and many others. So he also had a, a nice uh, quote I found that I think is particularly appropriate uh, for Anna's research in uh, maybe the field of RNA splicing in general. Uh, so at age 27, he published an essay titled uh, Reconstruction of the Chemical Events in Living Cells. And uh, in that uh, essay, he wrote, the mastering of a particular machine requires not only a knowledge of the component parts, but also the practical ability to take the machine to pieces and reconstruct the original. I found to be a really nice quote for, under, for what it means to understand something in mechanistic and molecular uh, detail. And so uh, today, I, I can't think of a more fitting uh, um, lecture than uh, Anna Marie Pyle's work on RNA splicing. So Anna is very well known for studies on the mechanism of group 2 intron splicing, uh, kind of at all levels. You know, the molecular details of catalysis, how these uh, ribozymes fold, and the structure of these ribozymes. In addition, she's really made uh, really nice contributions to our understanding of RNA helicases and how these functions inside the cell in a variety of um, ways. Uh, she's currently at Yale, and she's also a HHMI investigator, which she's been since 1997, and she holds the William Edward Gilbert uh, Chair of Molecular and Cell and Developmental Biology, as well. she's also a professor of chemistry at Yale. Uh, so with that, I'll speak to Anna, and uh, thank her for agreeing to come give this lecture. Thank you, Aaron. Well, it's an honor to be asked to give the Green Lecture. It's also an honor to be asked by Aaron, who has just done such amazing work in such a short time. And um, it's also super fun to come and see all my many friends here. Um, you know, I, I, as part of the RNA Society community, I spend a lot of time here organizing meetings and coming to meetings, and this is sort of a second home, so anyway, it's nice to be here. So in part because this is the green lecture, um, I'm going to be telling you about splicing today, and I'm going to try to do as much emphasis on sort of enzymology and, and, and how these function as uh, splicing enzymes as possible. And so uh, for the undergrads that are present, I also am going to give a bit of an introduction to splicing and mechanism of ribozymes. So for those of you who think about splicing you know, all the time, please forgive me. Um, and uh, and uh, we'll ultimately get to something that hopefully you'll find interesting too. Okay, so, so right here is my favorite splicing machine, and this has been the focus of my work, the group 2 self-splicing intron family. We'll be learning a lot more about that. You know, it's, it looks pretty complicated, and it is. Um, so we're going to start with something a lot more simple to begin. Um, one thing that needs to be said to really understand why we're talking about any of this today is that RNA is not functional until it's spliced. The central dogma made it some major ribbing. You know, DNA doesn't just go to RNA, it goes to protein. The RNA has to be cut and patched in various ways and modified in various ways before it's functional. So here is what splicing looks like for an RNA with one intron. Um, an exon is defined as a piece of RNA that encodes something functional, like a protein sequence. 
And often, two exons are subdivided by a region of RNA that doesn't actually encode for something important or may have secondary functions, and it's called an intron. And through the splicing reaction, this piece of RNA is removed, usually in a lariat form, I'll explain in a minute, and the exons are spliced together um, in a simple way. Okay, so that sounds very nice, very easy. Uh, not, although it's important to see that this is a two-step reaction, and we'll do that in a minute. But life is uh, not that simple. Um, an RNA that has lots of introns is going to look something like this, where you have uh, various uh, different exons that have different modules of, let's say, coding sequence, and the um, the boundaries between these exons have to be spliced together to create this sort of multicolored quilt that is now ready for function. Now why is splicing important? It's really important to you because most of your genes are in this category. You have an on average eight or nine introns in all of your genes. Okay, so splicing is a huge part of your gene expression uh, situation. And it gets worse. Um, this is what it looks like when every one of these exons is included. And you get a single RNA product that encodes, let's say, one possible protein product. However, life is not that simple. In us and in other complex organisms, exons are spliced in various combinations. So maybe the red guy will splice to the yellow guy and leave out the orange one, etc. here, <coughs> skipping these guys, giving you one of many combinatorial possibilities in gene expression. So in our tissues, our tissues all undergo what's called alternative splicing with different combinations of exons. We express different kinds of spliced products at different developmental stages. When we're uh, early embryos, we make different combinations than when we are adults. And what this has done is that splicing has enabled eukaryotes to break the one gene, one protein barrier. So this has facilitated massive organismal complexity. Right? So, you know, we can do a lot more with a lot less information through this process. So that is why splicing is important. Okay, so this is the first message I have, especially in youths, but not exclusively in youths. If somebody tells you that there are no introns in uh, prokaryotes and in bacteria, they are not right. There are lots of uh, group one and group two introns in bacteria. Um, the second message I'd like to tell you is that RNA splicing machines are predominantly ribozymes. In other words, they're machines that are made of RNA. They're enzymes, but they're not substantially in their active sites composed of protein. Um, so again, this kind of thing is catalyzed by RNA. So what are ribozymes? Um, ribozymes are RNA molecules that catalyze chemical reactions. They are true enzymes, although many of them undergo uh, um, autocatalytic reactions with one turnover. Ribozymes come in many different flavors, and I like to group them into these different sort of flavor groups in the following way. Uh, there are big, giant ribozymes that uh, mostly act to cleave and ligate RNA and DNA, and there are basically four of them. There's a self-splicing group one intron. There's a, a ribozyme that clips the termini off of your um, tRNA molecules when they're initially made. There's the group two self-splicing intron that we'll talk about. And now we know that the spliceosome, which as we'll see, is the big machine that processes with multiple turnover all of your splice sites, um, is also uh, going to fall into a category that shares a common enzymatic mechanism. And we're going to talk about this, this sort of catalytic mechanism of this class in great detail. Now I'm going to just run through the other classes that people like to think about, and we're not going to talk about them further in this discussion. There's another really big group of ribozymes, um, and they're all kind of tiny. Um, so some of them are as small as 19 and as large as 80 or so. And these are often uh, structured RNAs that are present in viruses and viroids and other um, contexts. And these are self-cleaving motifs that are conserved and fall into these families. They undergo an RNA reaction that's actually pretty simple, in which a general base deprotonates the 2' hydroxyl at the cis ion linkage, the bond that needs to be cleaved, and gives you a site of phosphate at the end and release of a 5' hydroxyl. Okay, that's these guys. So let's just say these guys have an easy task. They do a pretty easy reaction, because as you know, this is sort of a natural degradation reaction of, of RNA. 
as we'll see, these guys have a much more complicated mechanism. The other big uh, member of the ribozyme family is the ribosome, in which RNA catalyzes peptidyl transfer. The heart of the ribosome is all RNA, and RNA is doing almost every aspect of the peptidyl transfer chemical uh, reaction. And then something you may or may not know about is that there are DNA molecules that can catalyze, um, especially RNA and DNA cleavage and ligation. These have been developed mostly in a test tube in vitro through selection methods, but actually DNA can be a very good catalyst if you select for one that um, is targeted to a certain type of chemical bond. So those are sort of lurking in the background and they're sort of artificial, but they're interesting. Okay, so having defined ribozymes as a sort of as a whole, let's go back to talking about the group that we're going to focus on today, these big ribosomes. The large phosphodiesterase ribosomes catalyze this particular reaction, in which an exogenous nucleophile, and by exogenous I mean it's not this guy, it's a nucleophile that comes in and does inline attack as a separate molecule, or a separate region of the molecule, does inline attack on this phosphorus, giving you trigonal bipyramidal structure of the intermediate. And so you get this kind of architecture that will require subsequent protonation of the leaving group, and you'll get a five prime phosphate or linkage and a three prime hydroxide. Now, everybody in this family of big ribozymes catalyzes this kind of reaction. And when I say nucleophile, it's, it's all, always some kind of alcohol, either a 3' hydroxyl, 2' hydroxyl, or a water. Okay, so um, you'll see here, I circled uh, two, there's two big red circles here, and if you can see the print, it says magnesium. These reactions are almost always metal catalyzed, and this was discovered not through the structural biology done in my lab, although it was confirmed by that, but this was initially demonstrated through uh, sort of chemical biology methods that were pioneered by a guy named Joe Picciarelli, who's at the University of Chicago. And he basically uh, proved the um, involvement of these metals in stabilization of the leaving group and of the nucleophile by doing this really creative experiment. It's just like a genetic experiment, but it's with atoms. And it's called the metal ion specificity swap. And what he did, before we had any of the structures I'm about to show you, is that he substituted these um, potential ligands here, like these oxygens, with a soft ligand like sulfur. And he saw that when he did that, the reaction no longer proceeded in magnesium, because magnesium doesn't like to interact with sulfur. But if he dropped in a, a reasonable fraction of cadmium or zinc into the mix, he could rescue the reactivity up to wild type levels. And in that way, he established interactions between metals in the leaving group, the nucleophile, and I'm not showing you here, but also some of the non-bridging phosphoryl oxygens, okay? So this was a very important experiment, and it established that enzymes of this family proceed through a two-metal ion mechanism. He did this with group two introns, which we'll talk about in detail, and with the spliceosome, which we'll also discuss. And this was done earlier um, by Scott Strobel and others, and Joe with group one introns, and as we'll see, also with RNASP. Now, what I'm going to do right now is jump way ahead to very recent structural biology, which says that these predictions were correct. Here I'm showing you a zoom in of the active site of a bunch of our favorite large ribozymes, group two introns, group one, RNASP. And what's hard to see here is the um, RNA that sits, that uh, sort of presents the cis ion linkage. But you'll see that in each of these cases, there are two metal ions that are four angstroms apart that are in the ideal position to provide a two metal ion mechanism, much as you see in a polymerase, clinofragment, and other protein enzymes. And in fact, for a parallel, I'm showing you here RNAs H, which also presents two metal ions in the appropriate um, position to help to cleave the societal bar. Okay? So the reason I show you this is that these are RNA enzymes, and this is a protein enzyme, but they're all doing the same thing, and they're all basically utilizing a scaffold with a different kind of chemical composition to accomplish the same task of RNA cleavage. Okay, so this is the reaction that they all share, and so now we're going to funnel down our attention a little more, and we're going to focus on group 2 introns and the splice zone. And the reason I'm going to do this is that these two types
types of large ribozyme are the ones that do um, pre-mRNA splicing. So the splicing of messages to make mature proteins. Group 1 introns are important. They're important in a variety of bacteria and certain um, sort of uh, primitive eukaryotes. They're often important in ribosomal RNA splicing. These guys are what we need to do pre-mRNA splicing. So we're going to focus on those. Okay, so a little bit more about these. Um, group 2 introns are autocatalytic in the sense that they form a structure that folds and presents a single special backbone linkage, or single 2' hydroxyl group that serves as the nucleophile in the first step of splicing. That releases the 3' hydroxyl group of the 5' axon, and in the second step, that attacks over here at the 3' splice site, ligating the axons and releasing the lariat intron. Now we know that very similar products are produced when we undergo nuclear splicing with a big machine called the spliceosome. And this is what processes our RNAs in the eukaryotic nucleus. The spliceosome is a little more uh, complicated, as you can see. It is a group of conserved RNAs, and not shown here is a host of auxiliary proteins that are also important in this process. This is a unimolecular reaction. It's a one-shot reaction. Whereas this is occurring with multiple turnovers. The spliceosome actually acts as a true enzyme. It operates on a set of splice sites, and then it gets up, reassembles, and acts on another set. Okay? So for a long time, because they had similar splice sites and similar products, it was thought that they might share an evolutionary heritage. But we all questioned whether or not that was true. Um, it also implied that the heart of the spliceosome might be a ribosome, much like the heart of the group 2 intron. Uh, this was all speculation, and I actually didn't really engage in it very much. I just thought group 2 introns were really interesting. And I knew they would have very cool structures because um, they have lots of long-range interactions that I can see by cross-linking and lots of other things that suggested that their shapes were really elaborate and different than anything we've ever seen before. So I decided to focus on those and to be agnostic about the connection with the splices on um, And anyway, I spent about 20 years studying these as enzymes, trying to figure out their structures, and more recently, getting very high resolution structures to figure out how they work. Um, so what's the story with group 2 introns? Once again, like any form of uh, pre-mRNA splicing, they undergo the same two-step reaction I showed you before, where a specialized 2' hydroxyl group at one point in the intron attacks, you get step one, release of lariat is step two. Now you'll notice there's a little more detail in this diagram. I'm showing you that the splicing reaction not only goes forward, it can go very well in reverse. So this reverse reaction is an important thing to keep in mind, because after you excise a free group two intron, it's still a very reactive enzyme. And it can attack pieces of RNA or DNA and insert itself back in them through the reverse reaction. And this becomes important when you see that group 2 introns have another life. They're not just self-splicing RNAs, they're retro elements. And they played a big role in the dispersal of introns throughout all of terrestrial genomes. Okay, so what do group 2 introns look like? Their secondary structures show them um, divided into about six domains, and this is largely going out to be true over many years. Um, they do fall in three major families, which we'll see in a while, but those all share the following things. The first domain, to be transcribed after the 5' exon is domain 1, which is the largest domain. Domain 2 plays a small role in the architecture. Domain 3 plays a, a, a moderate role. Domain 4 is actually <coughs> does nothing for active site architecture, but it does encode an open reading frame. So stuck onto the periphery of this ribozyme, you can have a huge gene encoded here that gets translated. And the translated protein can come back and influence the splicing reaction. Um, it also becomes the site of the protein binding. Now the most important part on a group 2 intron is domain 5. It's also the only part that is highly conserved in sequence. So the thing that really confounded the initial people who discovered group 2 intron splicing were these very um, innovative people, was that it was impossible to learn about their architecture using just plain old genetics or um, by staring at sequence. There just wasn't enough 
conservation or phylogenetic covariation to understand them. Almost all the conservation was here, and as we'll see, in a linker here. But it was very clear that after domain five, there was a domain six that contained a bulged adenosine that would attack the five prime splice site, and you'd get the first step of splicing, this would attack the second step of splicing, and you'd have a lariat intron much like you get from splices only processing. Okay, and these, uh, these little sequences I've highlighted here are regions of the five prime exon that are recognized through base pairing with regions of domain one. So these guys base pair, these guys base pair, and you can, you can change them to anything you like and preserve the structure. Okay, so that's how group two introns are organized overall. Now, one more slide about what they do. I told you that they have a second life, and they do. You don't really want a free group two intron lurking around because they do the following thing. After they're excised, and if their open reading frame is translated, that resulting protein comes back and forms a ribonuclear protein particle called a group two intron coloenzyme. So you have this RNA protein complex between the group two intron and its encoded protein, which is called a match brace. This complex then does the most amazing reaction. The intron can recognize on DNA sequences that look a lot like um, its recognition sites within the intron, and it can reverse splice into the sense strand of a homologous piece of DNA. Okay? And then the protein partner, it has a DNA and a nuclease domain, and it can clip the antisense strand. And then if that weren't enough amazing stuff that this protein does, the biggest domain of this protein is a reverse transcriptase domain, which then comes back, uses this as a primer, and makes a complete DNA copy of the inserted RNA intron. So, so this is one of the ways that group two introns came to just haunt any genome that they enter and to proliferate within those genomes. There are certain organisms, Euglena being one of them, that in which 30% of the genome is now group 2 intron. And that has had a big impact on how those organisms diversify and procreate. So anyway, that is one of the other kinds of things group 2 introns do. Um, okay, so we studied uh, both the splicing and reverse splicing reactions of group 2 introns for many years, working out chemistry, uh, enzymatic function, and we reached this point where we really couldn't get any further until we had high resolution structural information on um, the system. So the, the field was really at a standstill. So if we wanted to really understand the chemical mechanism, um, how the RNA actually organized itself to be a ribozyme, to be an enzyme active site, um, we needed high resolution structural information. So we needed to go from this, which is the secondary structure of the intron we were working on, which is from the yeast to mitochondria. Um, we often call these secondary structures roadkill maps because it basically looks like your RNA after you've run over it with a truck. It's completely flat. And so it definitely lacks functional information if you care about enzyme macrocytes. If you add magnesium to basically the roadkill map, it'll fold up into its native tertiary structure. And this is the tertiary structure model of this particular intron. And um, it's very highly organized, and we spent the next 10 years or so studying um, how to sort of investigate the function of the tertiary architecture. But first, we needed to get high resolution structural information. So when I embarked on this, people said, you'll never get a crystal structure of an RNA this good. You know, you should just give up now. So I, I actually, in parallel, did a lot of cross-linking, a lot of chemical probing, lots of other things, which was good because that data enabled me to later validate the crystal structures I got. But nonetheless, we ignored omen sayers. We spent a lot of time looking for group two introns that would fold at very low magnesium concentrations and that were very, very stable. We finally identified one in the genome of uh, eubacterium um, uh, named Ocean Bacillus ibiensis, and after we transcribed this, um, we folded it into a typical group 2 intron structure, and uh, then we made many, many constructs. I should say the first construct that we made of the OI intron, when we put it in crystallization drops, actually crystallized pretty readily. Um, when we looked at the diffraction, it was at 20 angstroms, but we were very happy. We were at the synchrotron, and this, 
the, the, the staff member at <coughs> Synchrotron said, this is the ugliest diffraction pattern I've ever seen. And we were like, this is the most beautiful diffraction pattern I've ever seen. So we, we were okay because your first, your first iteration is just a start. When you want to solve an RNA crystal structure, then you actually do a lot of modification of the architecture to get better packing and to improve, improve the resolution. So, you know, making lots of RNAs for structural biology is a lot easier than making lots of proteins. So we don't have to overexpress this. All we have to do is make a plasmid and use overexpressed T7 RNA polymerase just to make as much of the RNA as we want in a test tube. It never has to go in and be expressed in bacteria or yeast or anything. So we made 127 different constructs of this guy, and we varied the lengths of various stems, loop uh, sequences, and other things, and just kept crystallizing them and looking for which ones uh, diffracted to highest resolution. Uh, finally, number 87 um, crystallized to uh, 3.1 angstrom's resolution, and we've since done better. I'm going to just show you. Um, what you see when you actually finally manage to phase your data, um, what you see before you draw the model, and I've actually drawn the model of the backbone in here to help your eye follow it, but when you're doing RNA crystallography, your electron density map immediately jumps out to you as having a discrete RNA structure. See so, yeah, how you can see these nice helices? You can automatically begin modeling pretty easily into this kind of data. So we've solved many of these structures. Our best crystals diffracted 2.7 angstrom's resolution. Um, this was phased with heavy atom derivatives um, several times in several ways. Um, we used iridium hexamine. We also used uh, ytterbium initially. The ytterbium is bind at the catalytic metal ion site, which is nice. Later on, as I'll tell you about, there are very key monovalent ion binding sites in this RNA. And they, uh, they bind potassium selectively. And you can uh, look at those by substituting in with thallium and rubidium. Uh, we have very good R3 values. This led to a lot of new methods because RNA crystallography is kind of still early. And fortunately, our structures agree with all the biochemical constraints that were kind of hard one when we were doing loss brute force uh, cross linking on the architecture. So, so we were pretty confident that it was a meaningful set of structures. So here's what it looks like. Um, this is the Oceanobacillus igiensis domains one through five, which for this intron is all we've been able to get. Domain six is dynamic and we never observed it. Now I'm color coding here. I told you that domain one, the, the five prime most domain, folds first, and it's the largest domain. And you can see here, it almost forms what looks like a scaffold into which all the other domains dock. And we'll see actually that turns out to be true. The other domains um, fit into specific positions, the most important being the catalytic domain, domain 5, which contains the active site, as we'll see. And you can see, as this thing turns around, the active site cleft has the 5' splice site tucked into it. That consists of phosphate. And as we'll see later, there are metals that surround this and participate in the cleavage reaction. But we'll get to that in a minute. To me, more than just the enzymology, that we learned from this system, we began to learn a lot more about tertiary structural organization. What are the nuts and bolts by which RNAs hold themselves together through interactions that are not base pairing? So this shows you just a few of the many examples that we gleaned just from that one structure. We learned that big junctions in RNA can be stabilized by all kinds of unusual interactions. This is a really cool interaction in which a loop region of one RNA um, contains sort of a slot for a base that's provided by the distal region of RNA that comes in and introduces this and interpolates it into the structure. And this is actually a conserved motif. And you can see that kind of holds the thing together like a, the way people used to make fine furniture where you would actually have tiny groove um, structure to it. Also, you see here um, stacks of three-stranded and four-stranded structures. What I'm not showing you here, because we don't really have time, there are lots of interactions that are mediated by the two prime hydroxyl groups of the backbone. This is probably my favorite part, and, and Jim Keck was organizing his lecture around this today. This, this is reminiscent of what Linus Pauling thought would happen in DNA. So there's parts of this structure where loop regions interact with each other through a three-stranded motif that's pretty interesting. 
Um, there are two helices that melt together through internal loops in the following way. There's a duplex that comes up here, and it flips out one of its bases, and that base interacts with a third strand over here. The next base flips in and forms a canonical base pair. The next guy up interacts with a partner over here, giving a zigzag appearance, and having this strand actually participating in a three-stranded interaction. So Linus wasn't totally wrong. Uh, you can have RNA that's inside out if you do it in small doses like this. Anyway, so there were lots of really cool structural features, and I think that was what I was most excited about for a long time. Now I'm going to skip over about 10 years worth of mechanistic work on the RNA folding pathway to just show you a movie that describes how the intron folds. So we actually have done a lot of, um, a lot of biophysical and kinetic work on this process. We also solved the structure of individual domains in isolation and watched how they change when the intron <coughs> assembles. So this is the crystal structure of just this domain in isolation, and it is crushed together to fold, bind the rest of the intron that has to open. So here's the closed conformation in isolation. When it opens, it is buttressed and trapped in the open state by domains two, three, four, and then that opens the space between these two, which then enables domain five to fit into the cleft and to present itself um, as the active site. One of the things about this that's really interesting, and this we found to be true in many RNAs, this suggests that a lot of complex RNAs have a first comes first folds strategy. So the first thing that gets transcribed actually folds first and forms a scaffold that promotes the faithful assembly of downstream units. Because RNA can misfold and make a mess really easily because its secondary structural units are kind of metastable. You can form many different possible stable RNA secondary structures. So hardwired into the transcriptional program of an RNA is often information about its folding path. And this really helps prevent misfolding, and group 2 introns rarely misfold. Okay, so we had learned a lot from this group 2 intron that we had derived from the most primitive form of group 2 intron called uh, class C, and is the most ancient form. Um, since that time, new structures have been reported of even bigger ones. So a more modern, larger, more developed class um, is class 2b, and a member of this class was recently solved by my former postdoc in his own lab, Navtor, and you can see it's a, it's a much larger challenge. The core architecture is identical to what we see in the 2c. And then, and this is a thing that will come up a lot in the talk, departing from crystallography more recently, Hongwei Wang's uh, lab in Beijing solved the structure of a 2A1 in a complex with its maturase protein. And that shows you the third class, the other very advanced class of group 2 intron. So now we know what all three of them look like. <coughs> Only in this case have, do we know how the structure changes through the different stages of splicing. And I'll talk to you about that a little more. But basically, the field has moved now moved quickly so that we can sort of visualize the entire family of splicing machines and how it's diversified. Okay, so let's talk about determining the mechanism of chemical catalysis by this intro. Um, Joe Picciarelli, as I said, did experiments um, about 10 years ago that suggested that this splices through a two-metal ion mechanism. And my very first structures on this actually show that there were two metals that were four angstroms apart. But we still needed to take a very close look at this through our crystallographic investigations. So, how is the active site actually organized? Let's take a step back and think about that. So you can um, tell just from phylogenetic uh, conservation that the most conserved parts of the intron are domain 5 and the small junction between domains 2 and 3 were actually equally conserved. And this puzzled me for a long time. What is going on with those nucleotides that they would be just as conserved as the most important parts of the intron? The answer came with the fact that they actually form one structural unit. These junction regions form a major groove triple helix with the base of domain 5. And then a loop nearby forms the top of that triple helix. Until this time, people didn't really think that RNA molecules could make triple helices in the major groove because the major groove is not that accessible to the neutrons. But it can occur if you do it over a short span. Anyway, this platform then 
enables another part of domain 5 adjacent to it to, to adopt a backbone configuration in, the, in which the sugar phosphate backbone curls very tightly upon itself. This is the tightest kink that's been seen in any RNA structure. And when you cram the phosphates together this closely by pulling the bases away, you create this intense electrostatic pocket. This region of very strong electronegative density. It's very focused and it binds two metal ions. And they're exactly four angstroms apart. Okay? And we observe these in the native map, just as a low time density, and then we confirm them through anomalous scattering of ytterbium and other metals that mimic magnesium at this position. <coughs> So these suggest that the intron performs catalysis, as Joe uh, suggested, through that type of mechanism. But we needed to be able to see it with an RNA substrate in the active site. Here you have a 5' splice site that we really crystallized in uh, and, and attached to the intron. And you can see this is the cisile linkage. It's perched right above the two metals in exactly the orientation that it should be for this kind of mechanism. So this was a while ago. And uh, there were a couple of things that bothered me about this data, and that was the fact that in the neighborhood, like right around here and here, there was additional electron density, and we didn't have the resolution, and we didn't really have the data to explain what they were. So we kind of went back to work. We built new constructs that would crystallize and diffract to higher resolution, and we got down to 2.7, 2.8 angstrom resolution, and we began to see um, density <coughs> that was um, consistent based on bond distances with monovalent potassium, okay? Potassium has been seen in RNA structures frequently. It's usually completely dehydrated. In other words, RNA atoms often interact directly with potassium and these bond distances were appropriate for that. This was an interesting structure that we got because for two metal ion mechanisms, enzymes, it's rare to get a structure that's empty in which the metals are still there even when the substrate is not. So this was kind of unusual, and we were excited about that. Um, in crystallography, in, in contrast with cryo-EM, you can actually nail down the position of metal ions by exchanging these weak uh, scatterers with something that's a big heavy metal ion that will scatter electrons even better. And for anomalous scattering, it gives you a strong signal. There is an ion that's exactly the same size as potassium, and that's thallium. It's also super toxic, so you've got to be careful. So we thought, well, does this thing splice in thallium? And another good one is rubidium. So um, I figured when I put together this talk, there was too much structure. There was not enough like actual reactions. So I want to show you the splicing gel. Um, I'm going to show you first here um, the splicing of an OI intron in the presence of its typical ions, which are potassium and magnesium. This is the precursor. Um, it hasn't spliced yet. This is basically the intron product and the largest exon product. Now, uh, group 2 introns, like many enzymes, many, do not function in sodium. Okay, sodium poisons lots of different <coughs> enzymes, not just RNA enzymes. And that's because we're potassium and magnesium beasties. Most of our cells are really uh, the most uh, sort of highest concentration of ions that are in, in all these two ions. So then I said, uh, well, what happens when we replace this potassium with thallium? So we, we saw that it actually loves thallium. Not many things actually function better in thallium, but this guy really liked thallium. He liked rubidium. And then we solved a whole bunch of new structures. We solved 14. Uh, up to about 20 additional structures um, of the same construct in these different ions and different ion combinations. So I'll just cut to this one, the thallium magnesium case. When you then look at the difference map for anomalous scattering in that case, you see massive anomalous scattering in the thallium case, particularly at this site, and also pretty strong at this site. You also see it in rubidium, and to some extent in cesium as well. So what this did is it enabled us to unambiguously assign those um, positions of electron density right in the active site as being monovalent cations. Okay? That was amazing because it meant that this wasn't just a simple two metal ion mechanism. It meant that group two introns catalyzed splicing using a heteronuclear metal ion cluster, much like kind of more advanced protein enzymes. And I'll show you what I mean by that here. 
A, a metal man cluster is a group of metals that share ligands and help to co-organize the binding site of the enzyme that they're in. And K1 is part of a cluster that's shared with M1 and M2. And in fact, what we see in structures that I'm not, I don't have time to show you, when you, when you blow out this site, M1 and M2 can no longer bind. Okay, they're gone. You have an empty intron. And so what K1 does is it helps to organize the ligands such that they will effectively bind M2. M1 is additionally stabilized by these. And in one of our structures, we actually can see water um, in undergoing inline attack on a five prime splice site. And um, what you can see then in, when you cleave that in another structure, you can see that then the cleaved product, which is a five prime phosphate, is then organized by K2. So in the first stage of the first step of splicing, um, you get inline attack and the involvement of K1. And then K2 plays a role in sort of managing the product after that first step and organizing them to get ready for the second step. So this was exciting because it meant that all of these metals in this vicinity have a role to play in chemistry. So up to this point, what had we learned? It's taught us that monovalence can play a major role in RNA chemistry. Potassium is really, really important in RNA structure and catalysis. K1 and K2 each play a distinct role. Group 2s are not simple two metal ion enzymes. They contain a heteronuclear cluster. And um, what I'm not showing you is that you often see in protein enzymes that have two metal ion mechanisms, you'll see lysine side chains in the same position as my potassiums are within the active site. So charges are placed at those same positions that do the same thing, okay? Okay, so what were the implications of any of this for evolution? Um, let me just check my here. So basically our crystal structure told <coughs> us that we had a set of tertiary interactions that made a triple helix between um, part of the group two intron and domain five. You see that in multiple group two introns. And then we did a phylogenetic analysis of the U6 flexosomal RNA. And we predicted and saw similar co-variation between part of the Akaga box, which is a conserved part of U6, and the base of um, the stem that it makes, U2. And then there's a similar bulge um, in U6 that binds metal ions, and part of that bulge we predicted to make another a triple interaction. So we made a prediction that the U6 splicesomal RNA is going to make a substructure that's a lot like domain 5. And using this basic idea as sort of a roadmap, Joe Picciarelli and John Staley's lab made, uh, made uh, metal ion specificity switches and uh, mutational changes in the triple helices and basically showed that the exact same arrangement of metals and triple helical bases is present in the splices on. Okay? So in, through these two papers, they basically were able to demonstrate that the nuts and bolts of this active site are carried over into this much more advanced one. And there were already hints of this um, in early structural work by um, Sam and uh, by Dave Brow and others who were looking at the uh, U6 structure um, and not just in isolation but in, in complex with a variety of proteins that it's going to have a very domain 5 like architecture. And this suggested, again, that there was a parity between two systems. And then more recently, as we'll see, uh, the spliceosomal architecture has been elucidated by cryo-electron microscopy, and in those structures you see the triple helix we elucidated, you see the locations of the metals. So this suggested that in terms of evolutionary relatedness, group two introns um, are related to spliceosomes through their RNA components. The heart of the active site is very similar in both of them. But what about the fact that group two introns use maturase proteins and spliceosomes are full of proteins? Is there a relationship between these two? So um, group two introns have protein partners. And as I said, they're encoded by domain four and they come back and bind to their parent intron. And we already knew that maturases were sort of like a sophisticated form of a reverse transcriptase enzyme. Um, 
the, uh, there's a portion of the match arrays that is basically a reverse transcriptase domain with fingers and palm, and then an X domain that functions basically as a thumb. And what I'm showing you here is just the HIVRT domain. And so based on uh, analysis of sequence, it was pretty clear that match arrays is having origin in some kind of RT. This part is important for binding, this part for splicing. So that we knew that thumb played a role in facilitating both splicing and retrotransposition, but we didn't know it why. So um, the big question was, are there parts of the spliceosome that look like these match arrays proteins? And so in this paper, these investigators actually were able to build an alignment of match arrays proteins that lined up nicely with a protein called PRP8 that is always right at the center of action when um, uh, spliceosomes undergo catalysis and chemistry catalysis. And you can see that there's really, really good conservation between these two, suggesting that part of PRP8 is a sort of uh, reverse transcriptase-like domain. Oops. Okay, so up to this point, nobody had been able to solve the structure of a group 2 intron matrix or any of the related reverse transcriptases, because they're also related to reverse transcriptases that are important in, um, in L1 retrotransposons, so line elements and other things, which make up 10% of our genome. So this is an important family of reverse transcriptases, and they were uncharacterized. So because we failed to do the classical ones, we actually um, used bioinformatics with a bunch of different criteria, such as these, to identify ultra-stable maturase proteins from the database. And we came across two that are actually found in human gut bacteria, not in any kind of fancy thermophile or anything else. And these guys crystallize to beautiful resolution. And I actually have to show it to you, because as you may have noticed, we've mostly been doing RNA crystallography and resolution. You know, we're really happy when it's in the high tubes. So I haven't seen beautiful data much in my life. So when these guys crystallized to 1.2 angstrom's resolution, we were really thrilled to actually have nice data to work with. So I have to actually show you that data. <laughs> um, anyway, so when you solve the structure, sure enough, these guys are beautiful reverse transcriptase-like domains. Uh, they have a finger, palm domain, and um, we also were able to thread the LPR1 element and other non-LTR vector on reverse transcriptases. So these represent a first in classes. Type of structure. They always crystallize as dimers, which in our hands we find to be functional. So this dimer interface, we believe, plays a role in splicing and retrotransposition. We can talk about that later. These are fully active reverse transcriptases. The active site is quite canonical with other reverse transcriptases. And I'm uh, just showing you this to be braggy. Like here is a, here is you know an aromatic side chain with a hole in it. So that shows you. <laughs> but anyway, so here's the catalytic metal ion uh, in the RT. This is a very processive, very accurate reverse transcriptase, and it's even active, not so processive, but it's even, here's the full length one, the gel is a little curved. The, the construct that lacks the thumb is even a, re, a reactive reverse transcriptase, showing that the thumb is a processivity factor. Okay, so why was this result important? This result was important because when we then look at homology, structural homology, using a Dolly search between our RT and anything else in the database that was an RT, the closest relative was the RT-like domain from uh, PRP8 in the spliceosome, which had been solved um, earlier. In fact, other RTs from HIV and other things were very divergent. In fact, the only thing that comes close to these two guys are RNA-dependent RNA polymerases from flaviviruses, okay? So clearly, group 2 intron maturases and the sort of protein heart of the spliceosome are closely related. And those guys are not related to conventional reverse transcriptase enzymes from retroviruses. They're related to RNA polymerases, which is kind of cool. Okay, so I'm going to try to look through the rest of this so you guys don't all fade away. Um, basically, this is just showing you the relatedness amongst the maturase and the RDLPs and PRP8 by a Dolly search. And so, not only are the RNA components of group 2 introns related to spliceosomes, but the protein components 
are related as well. And how do they fit together to catalyze splicing in a cell? That's the next question. And we now know that, actually. And we know that from the revolution in cryo-electron microscopy. Because in that case, we can visualize an entire splice cell. And this is the structure that was reported in Nature from Kiyoshi Nagai's lab, uh, mostly because he made a beautiful pymol session, which you need on the next slide. Um, and this is uh, the group 2A intron that was solved by cryo -EM from Hongwei Wang's lab. And you can see that uh, the RNA active site here is in red, and it interacts very similarly with the RT domain of both. And it's hard to see this because everything is so big here, but what I can tell you is the most important part of the protein's interaction in both cases is that this thumb domain um, is interacting with the position where the 5' exon is recognized. So the 5' splice site pairings are stabilized by the thumb domain in the group 2 intron RTs. You can see that in here, and I'm kind of pulling it out here. So here's domain 5, here's the 5' exon, and the elements that recognize that. So that is primarily how maturases stimulate splicing and retrotransposition. Here again, I'm showing you similarities uh, or, or the different RT domains and RTs that have been crystallized or solved by cryo in all these systems. And basically, what I want to show you here is that even in the splice zone, this is the thumb domain from that RT like protein. And you can see that it's interacting with the 5' splice site pairings that are made with you. <coughs> okay, so this is the uh, similar type of interaction that we see between group 2 intron 5' splice sites and its recognition site within the one. Okay? So in both cases, the nuts and bolts of the proteins and the RNAs even interact with each other using similar strategies. And this is just more about how the active sites are similar comparing the group 2 domain 5 5' splice site. The splice is only they're very, very similar. They both have the triple helix. They both have the diadema metal ions, although we should talk about that because that's hard to nail down by cryo And again, here is uh, the 5' exon in the same location. So what this boils down to is that all these different pre-mRNA splicing machines are um, basically undergoing catalysis using a related set of machinery. So these are related ribosomes, as it were. And all these splicing machines are metalloenzymes, and they use a very similar strategy with the two divalent metal ions um, that are important for cleavage and ligation reactions. This all means that RNA splicing is very ancient, and it originates from invasion by a transposon. Remember, group 2 introns are mobile gen genetic elements that just came from sort of a parasitic element that initially inhabited bacteria, and then was brought into eukaryotes during sort of early stages of eukaryotic evolution. So um, this uh, RNA splicing has evolved in the unimolecular process, as we move to introns, to something that proceeds with multiple turnover. In other words, a splice zone can, is nice. It's able to actually act on multiple splice sites, and so it's acting like a true enzyme, which gives it the capability to break that one gene um, one protein barrier. And RNA's uh, splicing reactions are stimulated by an ancient family of proteins. And these RT-like proteins didn't originate from other RTs. They originated from viral RNA polymerases. And so that means that in both cases, eukaryotic RNA pricing, processing machineries uh, came about through the taming of parasitic genetic elements. In one case, a transposon. In another case, an RNA virus. And so from that, we got our RNA processing machine. It's a pretty good deal. Um, and so, uh, let's see. I'll finish with that. And I will thank the grad student who did uh, almost all the new work that I talked about today, Chen Zhao, who's an outstanding student in my lab. Um, although uh, Marco Marcia, whose picture appeared earlier, and who's a group leader now at um, the EMEL, uh, he did the work on the, the metal ions interactions through normal scattering. We're also indebted to Nav Tour, who was the pioneer in group 2 intron crystallography, who started in my lab, 
Olga Fedorova, Sri Sanamarathu, who's now a PI at Drexel, and Joe Lieberman, who are really indebted to the teams at NECAT, the APS, HHMI, NIH, and then if you want to see more about what we do, just go to my website, which we try to keep current. And then I also just want to thank the whole lab. This is on our recent kayaking trip. We're right off the Long Island Sound, so we're on the water a lot. And uh, thanks to you for your attention. So we still really 
have trouble interpreting the existing maps of the splice zone to know where the metals are. But based on not just RNAsH, BAMH1, lots of other very well-studied protein enzymes, I think there'll probably be um, amino acid side chains, positively charged side chains that are like playing the role of the um, and you're right, I mean, Su Chen's results uh, were fantastic because they basically suggested to us that, that the splice system has some mechanism for control by these auxiliary metal sites. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen it, I haven't seen, uh, so, so it's hard to drive splicing in reverse unless you have a large amount of product to drive it in that reaction. Also, remember, as soon as splice, or rever let's imagine you reverse splice into a product, you're not going to splice out because the polymerase is going to trap it by copying it. So there are lots of, in the group 2 system, lots of systems for trapping you in the forward direction or the reverse reaction, and the same is true in the splice zone. Because the, as you know, the splice zone the reactions can go in reverse tip. So, so, and yet reversibility, we think, may be a mechanism for proofreading in both systems, um, up to the point where they're trapped. So it may be useful. 